This conference will now be recorded. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to a webinar entitled Protecting Yourself and Your Family Online. Today is March the 26th, 2020, and my name is Dr. Wes Fryer. I have shared this presentation with some parent groups, most recently in October of 2019 up in Edmond, which is just north of where we live here in Oklahoma City. And as we enter this time of a lot of working at home and remote school and just a lot more time in front of our screens and using our technologies, I thought it would be good to go ahead and share this presentation and record it. And I, uh, I'm anticipating there'll be a, a, a much larger number of folks that may see this as <clears throat> a recorded presentation that are here uh, joining us live. But um, if you're here live, I do want to invite you to use the chat window to put any questions that you may have uh, during the presentation, and we'll have a little bit of time. We'll try to respect everybody's uh, time and finish up here within 60 minutes. So we started just a little bit after the top of the hour, and so we will probably conclude just a little bit off after the top of the hour, but we'll just kind of see how this goes. So I do want to let you know you can access all the slides that I'm sharing right now a couple different ways. That is a QR code that I have on the screen, and so if you happen to have an iPhone or an iPad, you can simply open your camera app and point it at that QR code, and it's going to pop up a little message that offers to let you uh, tap and open that in the Safari browser so you can access it that way. You can also go to the shortened link wfriar.me slash protect. That's my own URL shortener and that will expand to a longer web address which is the Google slide share link for these slides. So you can access these and I welcome and invite you to share these with other people and especially Share them with other folks in your family, right? Because you may be the person who shares this information, you know, with mom or dad or with your parents or your siblings or your own children. Um, really, any of us using the internet and using the web today need to be taking steps to secure our own digital identities and our uh, family's identities. And so that's what we're really going to focus on. So I want to just start off by telling a quick story. I grew up wanting to be a fireman and my parents tell stories about when we would go visit different communities and we'd travel, I would want to go see where the firehouse was. And I even managed not only to get some tours of some fire stations, but at one time, I think even to go up in the snorkel, which was like a real highlight. And so I guess it was probably the little the television show emergency you know uh, i think i turned 50 this year so that kind of dates me a little bit as a child of the 70s and the 80s but anyway that was my favorite show that's what i wanted to do well fast forward you know decades and uh, what we find wes doing is not you know riding around in a in a snorkel putting out physical fires but helping a lot of folks with their technology fires and so these are my three main points today. Uh, and if there's anything that you're going to take away, hopefully, you know, this is it. And we'll kind of follow this as an outline tonight. Number one, to follow good password hygiene. And we're going to talk about what that means, because in the not too distant past, the advice people were giving about, hey, change your password every few weeks or, you know, every six months and, you know, how you were supposed to, you know, remember these really complex things and, you know, that advice is basically out the door now. And so we're going to talk about how we keep good passwords, what a good password is. And just like we want to practice good physical health and hygiene, we really need to practice good password hygiene. Secondly, we're going to talk about the importance of erasing your devices at least once a year. And, and I use the word device because today, you know, the, the, the phone that we have in our pocket that's a smartphone is really a computer. It just gets used every once in a while to make phone calls, but typically not that often relative to all the other things that we do with these devices. And so the third thing we'll talk about is monitoring and filtering both internet and screen time. And that is really important in terms of, of protecting our families and especially kids. So, um, I did this presentation, as I said, in uh, Edmond, Oklahoma at Central Middle School, which is the middle school right across from our church up there. We go to the First Presbyterian Church and we have a really great partnership there with the school. And so we had some interactive polls that we shared at that time. And I just wanted to share the result of that first one. And the, and the first question that I asked everybody 
to respond to was what causes you anxiety when it comes to technology and so we see things like viruses and you know speed and uh, lack of control um, you know pornography the mental challenges that, that are placed on us you know because of screen time um, but a lot of things or a lot of comments the things that are largest were mentioned the most <clears throat> change and the way these things affect our kids uh, the rate of change, those were all responses that people shared at that presentation. So I want to commend to you a fantastic book as well as author who you can follow on Twitter. I use Twitter all the time, constantly. Uh, I say all the time. I use it every day. <laughs> For the record, I am not on Twitter constantly. Uh, but I but I really do learn a lot from people who are sharing. And so Anya Kamenetz is an author. She uh, writes articles and sometimes speaks on national public radio. Her book that I wanna commend to you is called The Art of Screen Time, How Your Family Can Balance Digital Media and Real Life. And one of the reasons I like her perspective so much is that sometimes when we talk about internet safety, when we talk about screen time, and we talk about these issues, um, sometimes people might get the idea that we should just, you know, stop using our screens and, you know, kind of go back to a pre-digital lifestyle when, you know, everybody played outside until dark and, you know, no, no one, uh, you know, had to worry about how many minutes of screen time we had and whether or not social media was addictive and which of course it is, uh, it, you know, sort of to go back to that, that era. Um, today, as we are, you know, in late March 2020, <clears throat> we're facing a global pandemic with the coronavirus crisis and COVID-19. And in the United States, here in central Oklahoma, we are in the midst of having remote school. Our public schools are all closed. Our state superintendent just announced and the state school board voted actually yesterday that all of our schools are immediately going uh, to distance learning. We have been planning for that the past really four weeks. And so this is the first week our school has started. And so, you know, especially now, I mean, turning off all screens and not using screens is just not practical. So I think we need to find balance. We need to recognize how these um, devices and the content that are on them affect our lives, but we need to use them to our advantage. And I do believe it is the best time ever to be alive because of all, not only the things that we can learn, but the things that we can do together, the collaboration that we can do, the problems we can solve, you know, the ways that we can deepen and enrich our lives. Uh, and so I think that Anya has some really good perspectives on that. So I'll just ask this in the chat room if, if you want to reply and I'll go ahead and, and type it in there as well. Uh, do you know somebody, it's hard to type and speak at the same time, who has had their identity hacked or their identity stolen? Um, typically, I, when I've been asking this question, and I've been asking it for about the last 10 years in different presentations that I have shared at conferences and in professional development with mainly teachers, but sometimes also parent groups. You know, the number of hands that are raised when I ask that question consistently keeps going up and up. And so the statistics are, you know, pretty clear that crime is just continuing to increase online. It was a number of years ago, probably in the early 2000s. It was the the husband of one of my my doctoral uh, dissertation advisor who pointed out the, this dynamic that <clears throat> you know the more people that get online, the more online life is going to start to look like real life. And unfortunately, crime is a part of real life. And yes, it is continuing to increase. And so. This is a website that uh, I want to commend to you if you have not visited it already. Um, it is called Have I Been Pwned? And I think that is the, the right way to say that word. And that basically means have I been hacked? And so what you can do on this website is you can put in your email address and then you can see whether or not that email address has been compromised. If somebody has indeed, um, you know, gotten your password or been able to access your account. And I think what I'll go ahead and do is go to it live. So I'm going to click on it here and I'm going to put an old email address that I really don't use anymore. And we probably all have those and take a look at all the breaches that this particular email address was involved in. 
okay? All of these different incidents involved uh, the email address at least, but in some cases, the password, in some cases, my phone number, uh, in some cases, my date of birth, and all of this information right now is on what we, would be, what we would call the dark web. And that's a part of the internet that I can't simply access by going here to my Chrome web browser, <clears throat> but I you know, could access if I was using some special software. I could use the software program Tor, which allows for anonymous access, and that's a portal to the dark web. And so if you've heard of that, I think this website really can dramatize that for people because it shows that specifically for that person, for you, how many different times your email address and your password has been compromised. Now, let's talk about what this means. This means that if you are still using that password that you probably have used lots of times in lots of places, if it was used on one of those accounts that's been hacked or compromised, guess what? Hackers know how to access your stuff using that email and or and sorry, and using that password. And so if you've used that password with that email address anywhere else on a banking website, on some kind of shopping site, uh, any kind of hotel reservation or travel site, there's so many different places, <clears throat> then you know, there are programs today where hackers will be able to grab that email and that that uh, password that's been used before and simply plug it in to see if they're going to be able to gain access to those accounts. Uh, I don't know that I have this slide in here, but when the Disney Plus service went online, you're up here, you got somebody who joined. Let's go. Your mic, so I'm just going to mute there. Sorry. Um, if you'd like to, and I'm glad uh, that you're joining us tonight, <clears throat> you can go ahead and use the chat window, and that is going to let you uh, put in a question if you'd like to um, ask any question kind of as we're going through here. Um, so as I was saying, um, I was talking about the dark web, and I was talking about uh, hacked accounts. Um, I like the fact that this really, um, you know, makes it real for people, and allows you to think that goodness gracious if i'm if i'm still using that password oh and i was talking about disney plus <clears throat> there were people who thought their disney plus accounts had been hacked well they had but it wasn't because somebody did something unique with disney plus it was because of this it was because of repeated password usage and folks had gone to the dark web gotten email addresses and passwords and then they had tried to log in to the Disney Plus website using those compromised credentials. And so this is so important and it's just going to continue to get more and more important in the in the days and years ahead. So here's actually a screenshot that I had of uh, a different email address that I had used and you can see on each one of these some of them involved not only email address but also passwords, some of them involved password hints. Um, you know, we've we've heard about so many different breaches that we've started to perhaps be numbed to them and not think, you know, it's just another breach, it's just another hack. But what this means practically is that you and I and everybody in our family and all of our friends, everyone we know, needs to immediately stop using a password associated with an email account that has been compromised because, quote unquote, the bad guys have that information and they are actually using it actively to try to gain access to other websites and, and other places. So it doesn't take long to find reports, of course, about hacks. Um, when I had put this presentation together, you know, I did a, a search for the word hack and this was on Google News, which is a great source of aggregated news from a lot of different sources. And so there are lots and lots of examples of this. Um, I want to think. I want to go ahead and play part of this video, um, and uh, let me just. I'll ask into the chat, and if any of you want to uh, respond, uh, I'm going I'm to type in the chat. Do you know this YouTuber? I did not until this past year when one of my sixth graders let me know about him. Um, his his handle on YouTube is the Odd Ones Out. He only has 13 million subscribers, or he did uh, at the time that I captured this the screenshot. This is one of the best videos that I have found talking about 
scams that should be illegal. And I've actually used this in lessons with my own students. I teach fifth and sixth grade students media and digital literacy here in Oklahoma City. Um, and this is a, a fantastic video. And so I'm going to go ahead and play part of this. I'm not going to play the entire thing, but I'm going to play about five minutes of it. Um, and if you've got any comments or thoughts about it, we can use the chat window as a back channel to uh, make those comments or even ask those questions as we as we see this video. And also, I'm 99% sure that I've got everything set for you to hear this audio, but if you want to confirm that in the chat for me, that would be great, because I certainly don't want to sit here and, you know, watch and hear this video myself, but not have you be able to listen to it. So here we go. Oops. There we go. Me and my twin sister used to share a single Neopet account, which was a dumb decision because it was completely free to make a second Neopet account, and we already struggled at sharing things in the non-virtual world. But the reason we co-ran our Neopet account was because we didn't want to put our pets through a divorce, and because we wanted to save up our Neo points for a paintbrush. For those of you who grew up with real video games, in Neopets, a paintbrush was a super rare item that would change your Neopet's appearance based off the paintbrush you used. There were Christmas paintbrushes, baby paintbrushes, Guy Fieri paintbrushes, and an invisible paintbrush that just turned your Neopet invisible. Why? When I said that paintbrushes were a rare item, I meant it. You see, your average Neopet paintbrush would sell for about one to two million Neo points, and the most me and my sister had ever saved up was about a hundred thousand. Why did you spend 3k on food? We're trying to get paintbrushes! It was Flower 67's birthday, and you spend 4k getting that stupid jacket! The jacket is cool and you know it! One day, my sister went searching in the back alleys of the internet for other ways to obtain a paintbrush, and she stumbled upon this website that said, Get free paintbrushes! And all she had to do was enter in her username and password, and they'd send us a fairy paintbrush. Ooh. And in a moment of desperation, she entered in the login details of our shared account into a shady website, and you'll never guess what happened next. We log into our account, and there were three fairy paintbrushes in our inventory, and just kidding, we got hacked. And we lost all 100,000 of our Neo points, and we never got the paintbrush we were promised. But we learned a valuable lesson that day, which was, People will try to scam you, so trust no one. We were lucky enough to only lose virtual money, but some people aren't that lucky. On the internet, you have to deal with people trying to scam you constantly. There's probably comments underneath this very video of people using my name and profile picture saying, click on this link and get a free gift card, and they always use a stupid amount of emojis so their comment sticks out more. I thought it was obvious that those comments were fake, but some people still fall for them. Listen, we need to get one thing straight about our relationship. If I ever use this many emojis, I want you to shoot me. Scammers like to target non-tech savvy people, or what I like to call babies and baby boomers. There's a lot of things you can do to help prevent people from taking advantage of you on the internet, but my rule of thumb is that if something sounds too good to be true, it is. No one's giving out free gift cards, your long lost uncle didn't wire transfer you money, and you can't get free paintbrushes. You can't cheat the system, that's just life, man. Also, if you ever get a pop-up saying, your computer has a virus, call this number to fix it. Don't. A guy with an Indian accent named Jason will charge you real money to fix the virus, but won't do anything. Because you never had a virus in the first place. But those are all illegal scams. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop that. Um, this is a fantastic video. And so uh, we are probably all coming from different perspectives in terms of whether we have kids at home or not, and, you know, whether we have grandkids. But <clears throat> if you are connected in any way to young people, um, it is a really excellent video to open up a conversation about uh, not only scams, but just also ways that people are trying to take advantage of us and how we need to protect ourselves. Um, I've got a message there in the chat saying that the audio is breaking up a little bit. So I'm going to ask if, if that is my audio or if that is was just the video's um, audio. Um, one of the things that we are having happen. Okay, good. It was the video. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of people doing a lot of things from home now. We've actually got some, uh, you know, families that have three different kids, you know, that are all uh, learning from home and, and streaming and things like that. So, um, I uh, apologize if we if we had some disruption there at the end. Um, I'm also, by the way, just you know sharing a portion of this video 
so I'm doing that under fair use provisions of copyright law. Um, hopefully YouTube is going to be forgiving for me because this is where I'm going to actually, you know, post and share this. And I want to just do a big shout out uh, for this creator and for this video. Um, there are some additional videos that he has done that relate also to um, just, you know, media literacy and, and not being tricked. And so this is a I think this is a great video to reflect on. So if you have any thoughts about that video or about how you might see yourself using that, go ahead and put that into the chat. Um, I wanna point out that, you know, this isn't just something we need to talk about, talk to kids about. Um, my wife, her both of her parents actually passed away this last year, uh, but shortly after they moved to Oklahoma, and that was probably about eight, or seven or eight years ago, um, you know, they lived only a few blocks away from us in a retirement community. But, you know, her father actually purchased this plan to keep his computer protected and, you know, be able to have this company remotely, you know, connect and fix things, et cetera. Um, and I, I don't know if that company actually ended up, you know, stealing their, their information or doing anything more malicious, but, gosh, that wasn't something he really needed to spend money doing. I mean, I, I, we were happy to help and, you know, it was, I'm not the only, we're not the only folks that have, uh, you know, older parents who end up either falling for tricks like that or, or signing up for things that might end up putting things on their computer, which can cause, you know, further, further problems. And so, um, on a real practical note, I don't think I have this in the slides, but if you have an older uh, you know, parent in your in your life or a grandparent, uh, or if you are that older parent or grandparent, today, uh, one of the best computers that you could be using in terms of just not having very, very many problems, there's always problems and, and challenges with computers, but is, is Chrome, you know, the Chrome book that you can get. We have a lot of students using Chromebooks today. Um, there's just a lot of, of viruses and malware, and there's a lot of ways that people are going to try to put those things on our computers, and so we need to be really wary and really careful. Um, this was one of the articles that I pulled up in October just looking uh, for hacks, and this was talking about how, you know, students had hacked thousands of records in their school, and um, that was a crime. And, you know, one of the things that hopefully more schools are doing today, but I don't think this is very common, is inviting students who have very strong technology skills, especially skills that tie into security and hacking, to being what we would call a white hat hacker, using their powers for good and not for evil, um, and then seeing the, the job future for that, right? We need to have many, many more savvy uh, computer users protecting not only our country, thinking about defense and, and the military and the Pentagon, and all the contractors that you know work for our government and work for the military, but also protecting our businesses, protecting our schools. This is really a huge thing. So a few years ago, I worked for the Yukon Public Schools. You may have heard of Yukon, you know about Garth Brooks. Actually, I heard Garth Brooks was singing live, uh, you know, during this COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, Garth hailed from Yukon. I think he lives in Tulsa now. But anyway, I was I was working and teaching for the school district, and shortly after I had left the district, not related at all to my departure, uh, somebody had emailed the business office and pretended to be the superintendent and convinced somebody to go ahead and send all of the names and social security numbers of everyone who was a school employee. And that person thought they were sending it to the superintendent. They weren't, they were sending it to an email address that somebody else had made up. And that happened in March of 2017. And I'm not saying this to just throw Yukon under the bus, but I am saying that probably if you look around in your local area, you know, your schools have been affected by cyber attack and by what we would call phishing, which is when emails are sent, trying to get somebody to like, just like a hook, like you're trying to, you know, bait a hook and, and catch a fish, trying to get somebody to take that hook and send information, log in on a website that's not really the correct website, do those kinds of things. This is becoming really, really common. And I actually didn't mean to 
click on that link. So let me go back here. Uh, a lot of these slides have live links on them. And so you can actually, uh, you know, click and see the articles or whatever the resource is. Uh, we also had a situation this past May in Oklahoma City where we, um, where actually we live, and there was a ransomware attack that had hit the district right at the end of the semester when grades were being put in and all these things were wrapping up and it caused a real big disruption. And so ransomware phishing, these are things that aren't just rare events happening, you know, a long way away or across the ocean in another country. They are, they have already come to a school near you. They've come to organizations I'm sure that you know of, and, and they've probably come to you as well. That first Have I Been Pwned website I showed will let you know how many of the, um, you know, known malware or the known breaches that have involved hacking you know accounts and in some cases thousands and millions of different accounts how many of those have involved your account uh, the answer is you know quite a few um, equifax back in september of 2017 was one of the most famous and you know advertised hacks that happened and and that you know was over half of the consumers in the United States. I think there's something like 250 maybe million folks in the United States. And so in this case, you know, they were stealing names, social security numbers, and additional information. I wanna recommend another book to you. Uh, this one I actually listened to on Audible. I find myself listening sometimes more to books than I'm even reading them these days. But this author is fantastic. His name is Brian Krebs. And he is on Twitter at Brian Krebs. His book that I recommend is called Spam Nation, the inside story of organized cybercrime from global epidemic to your front door. And he has a fantastic blog that you can access free called Krebs on Security. And one of the biggest takeaways that I have from reading this book and continuing to follow Brian, and, and I, I do a weekly web show with a friend of mine in Montana where we talk about technology issues, and a lot of times those touch on security and some of the things we're talking about here tonight. Wow, is the environment online ever hostile? right? There are so many different people, groups, and organizations that are trying to utilize the internet for malicious purposes, and it's it's past time for us to wake up to this. I think a lot of us just, I mean, we're aware that some of this goes on, but we don't think about it touching us, and again, that question about identity theft can really bring that home. How many of us know someone or we ourselves have been a victim of identity theft? That number just keeps to keeps on growing and growing. So this is a fantastic book, whether you read it or you listen to it on um, Audible, and it's a fan, Brian is a fantastic person to follow on Twitter and to read his blog to, to get updates. Um, Brian has three basic rules for online safety. And I think these are excellent fundamentals for us to think about tonight. His number one rule is if you didn't go looking for it, don't install it on your computer. In other words, don't just see an advertisement that pops up on your device or an email message that you just happen to receive. Oh, look at that. I think I need that. So many online threats today attempt to trick us into taking some kind of action, and sometimes that's installing software. Now, so the, the operating systems are getting better. The latest Mac, Macintosh, Mac OS software, uh, which is called Catalina, has you know greater restrictions. And so you know, even to do what I'm doing tonight with the screen share, I had to click special menus you know, in my settings in order to give permission for that to happen. And so Windows 10, Microsoft continues to try to make that you know, more secure. But one of the difficulties is these operating systems are built on code bases that have millions and millions of lines of code. They're just really big. And so um, you know, that's why I mentioned the Chrome browser. Uh, using a, a smartphone, using a tablet, uh, using a Chromebook, these are all ways that we can utilize more secure operating systems on devices, and that, that rule number one is excellent. His second rule is that if you installed it, update it, and that is crazy 
critical. There are so many different breaches and security problems that happen because people are not updating their software. So you really do, when you get that pop-up menu that's legitimate, right? It's coming from your computer, not from a web page. Um, but when it's your computer saying, hey, you know, I have a new update, run the updates. If you've got a Windows 10 computer, if you're running a Windows system that's older than Windows 10, you are out of date and insecure. And this isn't just me saying it, like Microsoft does not support Windows 7 and, old, and or Windows 8, any of these older systems. Everybody today, both in business and at home, needs to be running a version of Windows 10 if you're still running the Windows operating system. If you're running the Macintosh operating system, you know, you've got updates that you can do up to a certain point based on how old your computer is and your hardware. You need to be running updates. And that also includes things that we have at our house. You know, we are, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the internet of things, all these different, you know, smart plugs and the ways in which we can have, you know, speakers that are smart and, and ways that, you know, we can talk and say things and, and have locks, you know, open, uh, you know, unlock in our house or lights come on or they can dim or the stereo can come on. All these different things are smart devices that connect to the internet. And so if it has an internet connection, that means it has software in it and that needs to be updated. And then the very last one that Brian has for staying safe online is that if you no longer need it, remove it. And that, that goes for software and it also goes for devices. Uh, we need to be doing spring cleaning. And you know, spring cleaning can not only mean updating software, but also getting rid of devices that we have in our house that we no longer need to connect to the internet. I know that we're hearing a lot about the, J the Japan uh, Olympics right now. In fact, I haven't read or really had the news on today to find out if they've actually been finally canceled. But um, back in 2018, I don't know if you knew about this, but there was a cyber attack that really uh, caused a disruption at the Olympic Games um, at that time. And you know, the opportunity that different groups, different individuals, uh, but usually these are organized groups, are going to take at, at large events, things like the Olympics, um, to be to to you know disrupt, to be able to um, you know try and take advantage of those those kinds of events, to draw attention to themselves. Uh, this was a New York Times article from February of 2018 uh, talking about that, and so uh, this was in. Korea, I think, South Korea, and um, the article states that security experts said they'd uncovered evidence. The attack had been in the works since late last year. It was directed at the organizing committee, and it incorporated code that was specifically designed to disrupt the games or even to send a political message. Attackers clearly had a target in mind um, because the word uh, pyeongchang2018.com, uh, that particular website, was hard-coded into their payload, as was a set of stolen credentials belonging to Olympic officials. And so that happened because of phishing, uh, which we've talked about before, that's phishing not with an F, but with a PH. And that kind of credential stealing is unfortunately very common today, and it is growing increasingly common. So we each have an obligation to protect our login credentials, just like we protect our physical keys that turn on our car, that open our house, that open up our office at work, we need to be protecting our digital credentials as well. So there's the word, phishing with PH. This is the English Wikipedia definition. Phishing is the attempt to obtain sensitive information like usernames, passwords, and credit card details, often for malicious reasons. Um, and so there is an example of a phishing message over there on the right where Somebody has grabbed the logo of a bank and they've said, hey, we're trying to contact you. You need to update your information. And they're trying to get you to click that link. Well, please, please, please do not trust links like this from your bank. If you think you need to check your bank account, go to your web browser, type in the address, Google for the bank website, and verify that you're on the correct website. Sometimes now we even see people, you know, spoofing addresses and that's why it's important, you know, which which web browser you're using, which search engine you're using. All of these things are being targeted by criminals today. And so that link, if we were to click that in this example, would not take us to the correct bank site. It would take us to 
a site designed by hackers to capture our information and then probably sell that information rather than immediately use it because you know there there are, there's a price on everything from a Gmail account to uh, you know somebody's Apple ID all of these things have a price and and people are selling these on the dark web and that would be what you know this email is designed to do. So spear phishing is a specific type of phishing where an individual is targeted by name. And this is something that we're continuing to see more and more of as well with organizations, depending upon where you work and what kind of an organization. If you work in the business office, if you make financial decisions for your organization, uh, you could be the specific target of that kind of, um, of of an email message, and we continue to hear more and more. There was uh, I don't have this screenshot of this article, but there was a woman who was famous for being on Shark Tank, and she was recently uh, she she went public with it to her credit because sometimes people are very embarrassed that this happens. They just don't talk about it in you know in public. Uh, but she had someone contact her assistant, and it was at the end of the month, I guess, when you know bills were due for some of the properties, and you know it was like tens of thousands of dollars that this assistant ended up wiring to somebody who was not the legitimate vendor that they were supposed to pay. She was a victim of of spear phishing. So somewhere in between paranoia and being naively oblivious is a good place. And you know, my goal is to is to kind of try to stay there. I don't think we need to go to either extreme. Um, but you know, thinking about the environment we're in, the ways in which it's a malicious and hostile environment where people are trying to gain our our uh, passwords, trying to get access to our devices, um, following good good password hygiene is really key. So let's talk about what that looks like. Whether or not your place of work requires something called two-factor authentication, you need to turn that on for at least your major email accounts and the accounts you use to log in to other places, but also I would say any banking site, any site where you have money, um, I would just turn it on everywhere you can. And the way this works is you still have to put in a username and a password, but in addition to those two pieces of information, when you log into a new device, that could be a phone, a tablet, or a computer, you also have to provide a second factor of authentication. And that can be a code that is texted to your cell phone. That's actually not the most secure way to do it, but it's better than not doing any kind of two-factor authentication. Uh, you can see a little picture of a USB drive. It can be a, a physical USB key like that. It can also be a code that's generated by um, an application. And so back in January of 2018, The Verge was reporting that over 90% of, of Gmail users on Google were not using two-factor authentication. And in this conversation, it's a little bit, if you've heard, you know, sort of the joke that if you're being chased by a bear, you know, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun, you know, whoever else is in your party, I guess, who's the slowest. And I'm not saying that's what I would really do. I think we want to we want to defend and protect whoever it is that's with us. Uh, so we wouldn't want to just outrun the bear. But thinking about this, you and I need to make ourselves a more difficult target than other people. Because if two-factor authentication is turned on, for instance, for our Gmail account, that makes us a harder target for somebody who is trying to hack our account and gain access to our information. And so this is still something we've been requiring for the past several years at our school, every single employee to have two-factor authentication in place. And that's been a little challenging. I mean, we actually do have an employee who does not have a cell phone and really doesn't want to get one. Um, and so that person uses a physical key to plug in um, when, when they need to, you know, log into a new device, not their regular laptop. And I think every 30 days or so, you have to re-authenticate uh, just, you know, again, verifying your identity, verifying security. So, what are the best practices when it comes to passwords? And I've got a little hint there to say it's not changing your password every six months. Well, the uh, cybersecurity experts today uh, are no longer, you know, they, they basically recanted because in the past, you and I heard something like this. Use a, a complex password that has numbers, capital letters, and symbols 
and you know try to try to remember that in some way by by combining like the name of the website and like your dog's name and something else you know have a little formula to be able to remember that well the password experts that came up with the, the, that set of advice have recanted and they no longer recommend that what do they recommend um, well, they don't recommend those kind of combinations because people tend to choose predictable combinations. And so <clears throat> what you need to do is use a very long password that is complex and it's also unique. So when you log into Facebook or Amazon or your email, the longer you can make the password, the more secure it is. And as I'm saying here in this slide, please add this two-step or what some also sometimes call multi-factor authentication to every web account that you have. It's critical because not doing that means that someone can simply use your email and whatever password you happen to use or that they can guess and then they gain full access to your account and whatever that account has in it or whatever it allows them to do. And so in addition to turning on two-factor or as it's sometimes called multi-factor authentication, always use unique and complete pa complex passwords. And I, I can probably guess what some of you are thinking, and that is, Wes, that is crazy. There is no way I'm gonna be able to remember all of those passwords, especially if they are long, because you're telling me every single website needs to have a, its own password? And I am saying that, but I'm not saying that you're gonna remember it. And so this is the next best practice. Um, into the chat, if, if any of you are willing to share, uh, do any of you currently use a password manager of any kind? The one we recommend at our school is called LastPass. There are a number of other ones. One Password is also one that I like a lot. These programs will generate unique and complex passwords. They will track them, and they've also added some features, and they call them different things. I think maybe what one password calls it the watchtower and basically it's an audit so it looks at all of the passwords and, and the emails that you have and then it compares it just like that have i been pwned website which incidentally is maintained by a microsoft security researcher a white hat researcher as i uh, talked about earlier it tells you hey wes you have you know x number of compromised passwords or, or this number of repeated passwords and I know this isn't a fun thing to do, but we all need to go through and make those password changes. So if you happen to have a Google account, as a lot of us do, some of us have more than one Google account, you can simply Google two-step verification Google, and it will take you through the steps of getting that turned on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Internet of Things. We've got about 20 minutes left here. And again, I'm going to try to be respectful of our time uh, to try to keep this at about 60 minutes. And we just we started a little bit after the top of the hour. So we'll we'll go just a little bit beyond. Um, many of us are purchasing devices now for our home and we have been for a while which connect to the internet that could be a, a thermostat that controls our heating and, and air conditioning that can be a doorbell uh, a webcam that can be a smart lock there's all kinds of things and this particular graphic on the wikipedia article for internet of things you know talks about what levels of configuration and cognition uh, and and uh, data and information sharing do these different devices have? And so why am I talking about this? Well, the more things we connect online in our homes, the more susceptible our homes are to hacking. And an example of this is something called the Mirai botnet which was an attack that took place in September of 2016. Brian Krebs, who I already mentioned, was one of the security researchers who was targeted. And this was an attack that, crazily enough, started with a couple kids in Alaska who were running a Minecraft server, and they wanted to basically hurt their competition. And so they figured out a way to create what's called a botnet, that is, a, a huge number, like millions of compromised devices that could obey their commands and attack whoever they told. And by attack, I mean sending a request over the internet. It's called a ping. 
And so this took place, this, this was created by these folks. And then they realized, oh my gosh, we've created this monster. And they released it out into the wild, in, into the world, because their botnet was able to use Internet of Things devices, like security cameras, like thermostats, like, you know, home routers and things like that. And so this uh, security incident, which happened in September of 2016, was the largest uh, type of attack that the world has seen uh, or had seen, you know, at that point. Um, there were lots and lots of network engineers who fought hard to keep this from bringing down the internet. This is a crazy story, right? It, it sounds like science fiction, but, you know, here are some articles from Ars Technica and from Brian Krebs' article, you know, blog Krebs on security. Um, this thing almost took down the entire internet. And, and it was created by a couple, again, a couple young young uh, kids who were hosting, you know, Minecraft um, games and, and then created this thing. And so why did this thing, you know, cause such, such havoc? Well, part of it was because people have not been updating their devices. And I'm not naive enough to think that sharing this webinar with you tonight and putting this on our, on my website is going to, you know, change these trends globally. But we've got to start somewhere and we need to be educating people about the dangers of not updating devices that connect to the internet and keeping things connected to the internet that we don't use. So this is a fantastic article um, that was on the Cloudflare website called Inside the Infamous Mirai IoT Botnet, a Retrospective Analysis. And it talks about how hundreds of thousands of Internet of Things devices were compromised in this attack. Um, the Guardian had this article uh, just talking about how many devices, over 600,000 Internet of Things devices, including home routers, air quality monitors, personal surveillance cameras, you know, all of these things were, were compromised in this attack. Uh, this is also a fantastic article from Wired. This was from December of 2017, and it was called How a Dorm Room Minecraft Scam brought down the internet and it, and it actually didn't bring the whole internet down but it almost did and you know it, it's just an, a, a crazy story that you may not have heard of so there's a market now for selling you know access to people's accounts there's also a market for selling access to compromised devices and it's really a, kind of a mafia thing uh, this is the dark web and this is the world that is often hidden from people but you know how do we stop it a lot of this starts with good password security and good password procedures. Um, so Mariah was, was scary. It was crazy. Um, if you're willing in the chat, how many of you have a smart speaker, uh, either a, an Amazon Alexa or a Google Home? Um, these are increasingly common, and um, I think they're fantastic. They're powerful, but they're also a representation of how artificial intelligence is starting to transform our society. How do you find devices that are secure? Well, one way is to look for certification. And so if you find a device that says it's certified to work, for instance, with Apple HomeKit, also look for certifications with Google and with Amazon, you know, those are things to look for uh, because those developers and the, and the creators, the vendors of those products are making sure that their software is compliant with standards and also with updates and things like that. We actually ought to have, and maybe at some point through consumer protection law changes, we'll have that in the United States where we'll have like an expiration date because companies, you know, unfortunately can't really pledge to update things forever, but there's a certain uh, number of years, hopefully, that companies are going to do that, but we don't have that, you know, happening quite yet. So we've talked about good password hygiene tonight. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, how you know, devices, if we don't update them, um, can be very vulnerable. Uh, what I'd like to talk about last a little bit is monitoring and filtering screen time and protecting our families that way. So I want to give a shout out to a presentation, a longer presentation than what I'm sharing tonight that I actually shared uh, with our uh, IT manager, the technology manager at our school back in December of 2018. And we have a series that we call Parent University at our school. And so uh, again, there's a QR code that'll go to those slides. And so I'm just going to uh, share a few of the points that we made in that presentation for parents, but it was specifically focused on these issues of screen time and monitoring and particularly using the, the new features in 
uh, what at that time was the latest iOS 12. I think now we're at iOS 13, but the latest operating system from Apple. Um, but before we talk about screen time, let's talk about web filtering. Um, if you're willing to put into the chat, uh, do you use some kind of filtering for content at your house? In other words, if, you know, one of your children or grandchildren or someone else is over at your house and they're on Wi-Fi, is there anything standing in the way of them putting in, you know, some kind of, of search query or, an, or a web address to a pornographic site, to some kind of malicious site that would have malware and bad software? Is there anything standing in their way? Um, I discovered a number of years ago when I was at our local Apple store here in Oklahoma City, uh, a solution called OpenDNS. And Cisco actually purchased OpenDNS a number of years ago. They still have a free tier, but they also have one that um, is um, available, you know, to, to purchase either for home users or for uh, a business. And what this does is it provides a layer of filtering for your devices so that uh, your devices can um, be protected. And, and so you will hopefully, you'll, you'll have at least a layer of protection, uh, you know, if, if somebody is doing a search and, and a result is going to be malicious. The web is a dynamic place. It's impossible to completely protect, you know, anything through a web filter, but these are two that we've recommended to parents at our school before. Um, and that obviously that's an old screenshot as far as the dates that are there, but uh, Circle Go is one that we used for a number of years at home. The website is meetcircle.com. That not only allows you to have filtering on your network over your Wi Fi, but it also allows you to um, have the filtering take place on devices like cell phones when your your children are you know on their data plan when when they're away and so anyway those are both two good things to, to think about as far as filtering if you happen to be a an android using family uh, google through their android platform has made some really good updates in what they call the family link so Google Family Link is a website to check out. You can go to families.google.com and find more information. And so like Apple, helping individuals and families keep track of screen time, keep track of uh, the kinds of apps and the uh, types of uh, internet use and social media use that's going on. Um, those those are, are now, you know, those tools are better than they have been before. So uh, Wired Magazine had a good article in September of 2018 about screen time controls. These have actually advanced even further uh, beyond what these slides show. Um, but basically I want to mention a couple highlights here and uh, then we're actually gonna be wrapping up. We're coming close to, close to the top of the hour. Um, one of the first things that you need to do if you want to put on some parental controls <clears throat> and also some monitoring of screen time and technology use, as a family, if you're using Apple devices or what would be called iOS devices, is to enable something called iCloud family sharing. And that means each person in your family who has a device, whether that is an iPod Touch, an iPad, or it is an iPhone, uh, you're going, they're going to have their own ID, but it's going to be part of your family as far as Apple, has, you know, as far as how you define that with Apple. And then you have control to both monitor as well as limit things that they are doing as your kids. And so the features that are available uh, include something called downtime when you're going to make, you know, the Internet not available, uh, limiting the amount of time different apps have, whether you're going to allow apps. In fact, when you turn on family sharing, that's one of the things you get to do is is get notifications when your child who's under 18, because, by the way, when they turn 18, it automatically turns off. Um, it is going to allow you to, you know, review that app and, and approve it. <clears throat> One of the things it doesn't do currently, and, and I think this is unfortunate, is once you've approved something, I, there's no way to take it back. And so if you end up learning more about that app and deciding it's not a good idea, I mean, there's, there's not a technology way right now, as far as I know, uh, through this iOS parental controls in order to take that back. But it also has some uh, content and privacy restrictions. Again, nothing is going to be a complete solution. But these are, I think, very helpful for parents, and it's important to know they're available and then to enable them if you if you want to. So again, fa <coughs> family sharing, pardon me, 
is the first thing that you'll want to enable. And then, you know, in the in the context of this conversation about monitoring and parental controls, I've already kicked around some of these terms. But when I talk about content filtering or web filtering, I'm talking about something that is going to block certain websites that are either in a, inappropriate or they are malicious. Um, and then there's going to be different levels of filtering that you're going to be able to, you know, put on there. Nothing is perfect, and I'm sure there's going to always be disagreement about, you know, categories, but category-based filtering is generally offered for, you know, different solutions that have that feature of, of being able to filter the web. Oftentimes, they'll have ages that they'll have, so, you know, is this for teenagers? Is this for, you know, kids that are under 13? Sometimes, it'll allow for what's called whitelisting or blacklisting. That means individually approving or blocking some specific websites. Um, and then I also mentioned family sharing in the iCloud account. So I don't actually think I'm going to do a live demonstration. Uh, what I'm going to commend to you is that you go ahead and check out the slides and also check out the latest features because, you know, even since I made these screenshots and referenced these articles, uh, there have definitely been some good improvements that Apple has made as well as Google to the tools that they have available. So I'd like to go ahead and open this up to questions. So if you'd like to type a question into the chat, if you've got anything that you are uh, wondering about or that you'd like to ask in, in reference to what I've presented and talked about tonight, um, I want to remind everybody again that you can access these slides. I've got my main website there on the, on the screen, but uh, this webinar I'm actually offering through a series that I'm uh, calling Design, Create, and Share. And this particular webinar, you know, isn't specific to, hey, let's create a video. Hey, let's make a sketch note. Um, you know, let's let's design a lesson for students as most of the other webinars in this series are going to be. Uh, but again, with the COVID-19 coronavirus uh, crisis upon us, much more screen time happening, I just felt like it was it was really important to uh, talk about security because if this is the this is the cornerstone of the house, right? If you don't have your web accounts locked down, your secure your your uh, security in place, you really can't do much more because you're you know you're going to be stopped. You're going to your 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 uh, information is going to be compromised. You're going to be prevented from doing what it is that you want to do online because other people have gained access to your information. So I've got a question in the chat about uh, one password and if we can find out more information about it. Uh, yeah, certainly. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, exit my presentation here and I'm going to um, just go to the web and I'm going to um, put in, um, well, let, let me talk about LastPass first. LastPass is completely free for individuals. It's the one that we actually recommend for our faculty and staff, and we have for a while. Um, you can create a free account, and it has a Chrome extension that you can install, um, an extension for Firefox. It also has an app that you can download for your Android or your, uh, your iPhone, and um, it's, it's outstanding. And uh, again, it's the one that we've recommended for a little while as a password manager. Um, another one, which I think is really fantastic and recommend is called 1Password. And this one is not free. So when you go under pricing, um, you can see that depending upon, you know, what kind of situation you're in, uh, I think you get five accounts if you uh, do the business. Uh, well, actually that's team and business. Let me go over here to personal and family. <clears throat> so if you've got a family account, um, it's, they're saying it's going to be five dollars a month if you if you build annually. So you're going to have to do five times twelve in order to to get that price. Uh, if you just have your yourself as an individual, you can do do that less. Uh, and so you know what that allows you to do is to, as they say, have basically a safety deposit box with a digital key. So you can put all of your accounts, your Amazon, your Netflix. Um, you know, your, your banking, all of that kind of stuff, and you're going to be able to keep that secure and private. Now, people ask, well, wait a minute, Wes, doesn't this just mean, you know, you're putting all your eggs in that basket? What if somebody compromises, you know, that account? And certainly that is a possibility, right? If, if somebody gains access to your password manager, then they've gained the keys to the kingdom. But password managers like LastPass and like 1Password uh, do some, some even you know, more extensive 
take even more extensive protective measures. Uh, for instance, with 1Password, you have to have a very long security key in order to gain access to your account. And once you're logged in, you know, you're able to share that with a code with some other devices, but it's not simply just a username and a password that gets you in. Uh, and they're taking those additional steps, kind of like two-factor authentication, where you have to have another, you know, very long and complex number in order to, you know, gain gain access to it. And what what these devices also let you do, or, or services let you do, is print what some of them call an emergency kit, and that is a, either a set of codes or a code that you can use in an emergency to unlock your account. If you forget your account number, you're not able to gain access, and so what I recommend is that you print that emergency kit and then put it in a safety deposit box in the bank or you know wherever you're storing passports and marriage certificates and birth certificates, things like that. Um, you know, protect that information just like you would protect those other essential documents. And so those are two, um, you know, password managers that I would recommend. Um, I'm also, while I'm uh, mentioning just recommendations, I have learned a ton about security and I haven't listened to their show, you know, super recently, but this is a fantastic show called Security Now. It is on the Twit Network, which is This Week in Tech. Uh, Leo Laporte, who is the primary, I think, owner and uh, guru in chief of, of Twit is, is the, is the co-host. But Steve Gibson, who is a security professional and has been working in the, in the arena of computer security for years and years, is the person who uh, gives this podcast and it is available for free. And I've definitely you know, learned a ton uh, listening to their podcast over the years and highly commend that to you on this topic. And it's it's a geeky podcast, right? This is not necessarily going to appeal to everybody, but as you want to learn more about security, that is definitely a good, a good place to go. Um, so we've kind of gone over the top of the hour a few minutes, but as I said, I wanted to give an opportunity for some questions, and I want to thank those of you that have tuned in live. <clears throat> I also want to encourage you, I'll go ahead and I guess show this as well, uh, to visit the website that I've set up for this webinar series. This is called Design, Create, and Share. If you click the link, uh, and this may change by the time you take a look at it, but for videos, you can see the archived webinars. Last week, we had a webinar about family oral history projects, and so I've got both the slides and the recorded audio for that session available there. And uh, on this uh, particular session about protecting yourself and your family online, I'll be doing the same thing. I'll be making this video available as well as the slides and would welcome uh, any of you, if you've got questions, um, I will, uh, I'll be sending you these slides via email if you register via Eventbrite for this uh, webinar and you can you know, contact me if you've got questions. Um, you can also certainly uh, just simply Google my name uh, West Fryer, and I need to do some updates actually oops, on my main page here, but <clears throat> you can go to my main website, westfryer.com, and I've got a contact link, and uh, you can contact me that way. So thank you so much for attending. I encourage you to stay savvy and stay safe. Please share this information. Share the information that we have talked about tonight, because you know you very well could be the person who brings this information to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers, and everybody who's online needs to be taking safety and security very seriously and probably making some changes to behaviors and routines that we've had for a number of years when it comes to things like passwords and logins. Um, we need to shift into a new normal and, and use some of the tips and suggestions that we've talked about tonight. So thanks so much for tuning in and good luck to you.